Hello dear, it's nice to have you on our channel today. I would like you to like this video and share this video to friends and family as we're about to dive into the word of His grace. Today, we are continuing our series where we title The Fate of Our Fathers. In the book of Genesis, the Bible tells about four mighty men of God. And today we're looking at the third man. His name is Jacob. Today we're going to look at the spirit versus the flesh. You know, the meaning of the word Jacob means cunning. And it shows that um, Jacob's life was going to be a life of deceit. And it was prophetic about his life that he will, he will use this as his dominant trait to get whatever he wants to get in his life. That means he was going to trust in his flesh to get whatever he wanted to get in his life. But we can see that Jacob is a testimony of God's grace. How that the power of grace can transform a person's life and how that the purpose of God is that once we are justified, he makes us sons like he's in the life of Isaac. And after that, he would transform us into Israel. That means a prince of power with God. Not only that means we will not just live our lives based on the flesh, but we will live our lives based on the spirit. So we're going to look at how did God transform us and how God transform us. Get ready for the message. Get your notepads ready. Get your ears ready as we are going to dive into the scriptures. And we're going to study about how God transforms our lives so that we don't work according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Joining us today for the first time, we started a brand new series titled The Fate of Our Fathers. And um, we we'll recommend that you listen to the first two messages. It will help you to build a foundation of where we're continuing today. Um, we started to study on the book of Genesis and we saw um, the book of Genesis talks about the creation story, but all, all of a sudden the scripture begins to zoom on four men. And that's what we're studying the, fa the fate of our fathers. That's our series title, The Fate of Our Fathers. And we saw about Abraham. We were last week, the last two weeks we saw about Abraham. Last week, Sunday, we saw about Isaac. Today, we're going to study about Jacob. And next week, we're going to study about um, the last guy, Joseph. Now, um, last week, Sunday, we saw that how that God makes us sons and not servants. And we saw that if you have a servant mentality, you will not receive the inheritance. You will not receive the promise. Because the promise is only made to sons. Praise God. And sons is by birthright. You are a son of a man because you, he gave birth to you or he adopted you. Any of the two. And the Bible lets us know that we are the adopted sons. So God gave birth to us and he also adopted us. Praise God. And then we saw that today we're going to do a story about Jacob. Everybody say Jacob. You know, in those days when, um, when Rebecca gave birth, um, actually when she was pregnant, the prophecy was that two, two nations are your own. Right? And the Bible says that there was a turmoil between the two in, the, in, in her belly. Now when they were born, Esau came out and Esau was so hairy. And then she called him Esau. Esau means hairy. Because in those days, the Hebrews would name children based on how they see them, how they see them or based on their attributes. Are you following? Uh -huh. Or based on the circumstance that surrounds the pregnancy. How they named children in those days. So when Esau came out, Esau was so hairy. And so they named him Esau. Esau means hairy. And then the second one was Jacob. The reason why she named him Jacob was because of what was happening in the stomach. <laughs> Praise God. And, and, you know, so she named him Jacob. Jacob means, if you know somebody that's called Jacob, I, I advise you to change that name. Because Jacob means cunning. It means heel catcher. It means to go behind the back. Basically, it means to plan this act in deceit. So Jacob means this, um, deception. It means deceit. Are you following? And this was prophetic about the life of Jacob. That this is going to be, his, it, um, this will become his dominant trait as a person. Right? That means for Jacob to survive in life, he was going to deceive, he was going to manipulate to get his way in life. And that means that Jacob was trusting in his flesh. So today, the title of our message is Spirit versus Flesh. Everybody say Spirit versus Flesh. We are going to see how Jacob walked in the flesh, and we're going to see how Jacob walked in the spirit, and how does this apply to us today? Now, Jacob is a testimony of the power of God's grace to transform a human person. Because the purpose of God is that after we have been justified, like Abraham was justified by faith, then he wants to make us sons, like he made Isaac to be the seed of Abraham. And after that, God wants to transform us into an Israel. Because there was a, there was a certain moment in Jacob's life where God called him and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel means a prince with God. And God wants us to be prince together with him. Can you say amen? So, so, so Jacob, 
um, he moved from the life of being a deceiver to become a man that has power with God, that man that is a, is a prince with God. So God wants us to also become prince together with him, as Jacob was by the grace of God. So how did God, how did God transform Jacob? How did God transform a deceiver? How did God transform a guy who was always crooked, cunning in all his ways? How, and how does God transform us today as well? We're going to look at four things today, and we're going to see how he applies to Jacob and how he applies to our lives today. Glory to God. Now, let's know number one. God transforms us by a process of gradual transformation, not crisis encounters. In the church today, I mean, if you grew up in the Pentecostal environment, um, we always want to have a crisis encounter. We think that the one-time event is all we need. But So, that's not how God builds us. God builds us. God builds us by a process of gradual transformation. Everybody say gradual transformation. Growth is a process. Growth is not a miracle. Growth is a process. And we have to grow. In your Christian life, you have to grow from stage to stage, from level to level. And once you are justified in Christ, are you listening? And you are made to be son, the process of sanctification is a gradual transformation. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's a gradual transformation. Because look at look at um, look at his life. After after um, the, the father was about to die, and the father said he wanted to transfer the blessing to Esau, even though God told the mother and God told them that the younger, sorry, that the elder will serve the younger. So the blessing was supposed to be given to Jacob. But because of um, Isaac's um, Isaac's um, um, favoritism, he wanted to pick Esau to, to take the blessing. So when the mother heard about it, they planned a coup. And look at every say deception. They deceived the father. So the father thought, I mean, that's the life of Jacob. The father thought he was transferring the blessing to Esau, not realizing that he was giving it all to Jacob. And when Esau came, Esau, it was too late for Esau. So from that day, that was the last day the mother ever saw a child. Because of competition, favoritism, wanting to help God. You know, some, some people even think that this phrase in the Bible, heaven helps those who help themselves. They think, they think it's not the Bible. There's no such, there's no such scripture. <laughs> God, heaven doesn't help those who help themselves. It's not, it's not biblical. It's not scriptural. It, that's a fleshly idea. It's not a spiritual idea. God only helps those who come to the end of themselves. Can you shout amen? <laughs> God only helps those who come. To, so so, so um, the more that wanted to help God to fulfill the prophecy. This was the prophecy that God told us. It must come to pass. So they schemed their way. They deceived Isaac. And then Isaac transferred the blessing to Jacob. And from that day, Jacob had to run from Esau. And listen, when he ran, something happened to Jacob. He had an encounter with God. And in that encounter, in the dream, you know, most, most of the time in Jacob's life, God usually would talk to Jacob in the dream. It's as if that's the only way God can get his attention. He's always too busy. So when he's sleeping, God will not come to him and talk to him in the dream. So when he was having a dream, something happened to him in the dream. The Bible says that there were ladders going up from heaven and to earth. And angels were walking up the way, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then when Jacob woke up from the sleep, he said, wow, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And he named that place Bethel. Everybody say Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And you know, that encounter, God promised Jacob many things. That the same promise he made to his grandfather, Abraham, and the same promise he made to Isaac, he's also transferring the same promise to Jacob. God said, I will bless you. I will make your name great. You see that in Genesis 28. And then God was giving him all these blessings. You know what the guy did? After all this experience and encounter, you know what he told God? He said, God, see, fleshly mindset. God, if you do this for me, if you bring this to pass, because he knew the trouble he's into. He said, God, if you make this happen, if you reconcile me with my brother, if you do all these things you said to me, then I will give you a tenth of all that you're giving to me. Can you imagine that? I mean, is God really impressed by what he just said? I mean, God said, of all the things I will do for you, he was still having this, this um, fleshly mentality. I want to see how to pay God back some way for what he has done. <laughs> so he said, of all that God will give to me, I will only give God 10%. That's what he told God. And God just ignored what he said because he was still having the fleshly mentality. He's still having the fleshly mentality. He wants to do things by his effort, by his self-effort. He cannot trust God completely. Glory to God. So the dream reassured him that there was no need to manipulate anymore. But Jacob would not realize. He could not still trust God enough that God was going to bring the promise to pass on his life. But you see, 
What, what Jacob did was that Jacob responded to the grace of God in a fleshly manner, not in a faith manner. He responded to the, to, the, to, the, to the promise of God in a fleshly manner. And after the divine encounter, Jacob was greatly encouraged, but he didn't change him. So that tells you that encounter is not enough to bring absolute transformation. Because Jacob had an heavenly encounter. He saw angels in his dream. He saw even that God was in this place. But that didn't change Jacob. He was still going to scheme his way in life. He was still going to manipulate his way in life. Glory to God. I said glory to God. You know, many Christian meetings today is aimed at bringing people to a crisis encounter. At the altar call, for instance. And you think that's all. That's not all. That's just the beginning. That's where it starts. The journey of the Christian life doesn't end at the altar call. Mm -mm. That's where it, that's, it actually starts. It's like giving birth to a baby as a mother and say, that's all. I've done the job completely. That's not all. That's when the work starts really. Because you have to nurture that child, take care of that child until it grows to become an adult. Glory to God. That's the way for the Christian life. So that's the way our life changes because God changes us by a gradual transformation. Everybody say gradual transformation. So we have received, and the Bible tells something in 2 Peter, that everything that pertains to life and godliness, we already have. It says, as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So there's nothing missing in your life. Everything you require for your life and godliness was already given to you in Christ. So we have already received everything for life and godliness. So sanctification is a gradual process by which we learn to walk in the spirit. The Bible said if you are in the spirit, it's therefore walk in the spirit. That means you walk in the spirit by faith and you bring out what God has already walked in you. The Bible says walk out of salvation with fear and trembling. How do you do it? You bring out what God has put in you. You're not looking for something outside. It's already inside you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Look at what the scripture says there. I need you guys to be very fast with me. Thank you, Lord. He says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord are you seeing that so how how does transformation happens it happens when you look into the mirror are you seeing that what is the mirror the mirror is the word of god remember your bible is about four people it's about the father it's about the son it's about the holy ghost and it's about you so when you open the scripture the scripture is an album it's a picture album of our family are you seeing that? Now, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, as you look into the mirror. When you look into the mirror, and the Bible says, as he is, who am I? That image that you see, once you accept that image, it transforms you from glory to glory. Glory to God. So that's the reason why the only way you can become all that God has made you in Christ is to look at the mirror of God. And the mirror of God is the word of God. He says, with, 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 with open face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of God. Look at that. And he's telling you that you also are the glory of God. He says, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Number two, how does God transform us in a life of, similar to the life of Jacob? Number two, by the law of sowing and reaping. Everybody say sowing and reaping. Now there are two kinds of sowing and there are two kinds of reaping. We'll look at that today. Now listen very carefully. All of our sins before we were born was all paid for in the body of Jesus. So we don't inherit any, so basically what we sowed, Christ reaped, and what he sowed, we reap in the cross. Are you following this very carefully? But after you are saved, after you are born again, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap in the flesh. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap in the spirit. So what does it mean to sow to the flesh? Look at Galatians 6, verse 7 to 8. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. Are you seeing that? Give me the next verse, verse 8. So I said verse 7 to 8. Okay, verse 8, thank you. He says, for he who sows to the flesh, what will happen to him? He will of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he who sows to the spirit, will of the spirit reap what? Everlasting life. You see that? So how do you think? You know, you know Jacob was sowing to the flesh. 
hide his soul to the flesh, he was sowing deception. He deceived his father. You know what happened to him one time? When he went to the river in Genesis 29, he met, uh, uh, he met some guys there and then he met a young lady, very beautiful lady. Her name was Rachel. And then when he got to Rachel, he, Rachel, he found that Rachel was actually like his family relative. He said, wow, this is good. Because the father told him, don't marry anywhere except from this place. So when he met her, he found out that this one is the right person to marry. So he went to the house where the lady is living. And then he met the father. He met Laban. When he met Laban in that house, he told Laban that, Kai, man, he wants to marry this his daughter. He now said, okay. So he now told the, the man that, but what can he do? The man said, so how are you going to pay? He said, no, you know what? So I'll work with you for four years. I'll give you seven years of my life service. After I serve you for seven years, then I will take Rachel. Praise God. The father said, okay. In fact, there's no other person I want to give my daughter to you except you. So he agreed. So now, deceiver met senior deceiver. Glory to God. He soaked to the flesh, he reached in the flesh. So after seven years, you know, in those days, I don't know, maybe they were marrying without all electricity. Maybe there was in the night, no light, no candle, no nothing. And then the guy took his new wife, because she was veiled, took his new wife, and the veil they used to wear is not transparent veil like we do today. So you can't see the lady. After the day of the ceremony, he took his wife to the house. After he finished with her in the, in the night, in the next morning, he woke up and said, what is going on here? Lo and behold, he saw Lee, Leah. Now, <laughs> he now said, Laban, you deceived me. A man said, yes. Now, deceiver was not deceived. <laughs> he now met his match. It's as though Laban knew that, man, I'm going to show this boy that I still let you walk when it comes to deception. He sold to the flesh, he reached in the flesh. Glory to God. And he read corruption. So he had to serve another seven years. After seven years again, that's 14 years now. Then he now was given um, Rachel. Then he lived another six more years with Laban. Before he said, you know what, sir? It's time for us to go. So he served him basically 20 years of his life. And he said, you know what? It's time for me to go. And then he left. <laughs> Glory to God. So you can see that probably... Um, the same way Isaac felt when Jacob deceived him was the same way Jacob now felt and felt when Laban deceived him. Glory to God. So what does it mean to sow, with the, sow, sow into the spirit? Look at Genesis 31 from verse 11 to 12. You know what God did with Jacob? When Jacob decided to listen to God, something supernatural happened to him. When he was about to leave Laban, he told him that, Sir, it's time for me to go because God caused a trouble Genesis 31, I told you, from verse um, 11 to 12, quickly. So, um, Laban met with Jacob and said, Sir, you know, the chaos that's going on between us, it's time for me to leave this house. Are you following? Then, you know what happened next? Then, he now said, okay, so how am I going to pay you for all this your work that you have done? You know, Jacob, because the, God already spoke to him in the night. And God told him exactly what to do. And what he did is actually scientifically proven today. But guess what? He had the revelation from God. Because in the spirit, God gave him, God told him exactly what to do. And he followed God exactly. And he got a wonderful result. You know what he told um, um, Laban? He said, you know what? This is how you are going to pay me. Since I've helped you, I've blessed your farm, you have so much cattle. You know what's going to happen? I will take all the sparkled animals, the goats, the sheep, all the ones that have spot on them. That will be, that will be the ones for me. I'm sure Laban was wondering, what is this guy up to now? He's just watching and say, oh, this guy is not trying to scam me. Or what's he going to? So he said, you know what? All the ones that are so clean, without spot, without any sparkle, they'll be yours. But my own, I will take all the ones that have blemish, all the ones that have sparkles. He said, I'll take them for myself. And then you know what Jacob now did? <laughs> After Jacob took all the, and then Laban said, you know what? Okay. Because Laban actually, when he saw the mathematics of what he was doing, the sparkled animals were fewer to the ones that were plain. So he said, okay, since you're taking me some money, voila. he agreed to the agreement. You know what Jacob now did? After Jacob removed all his sparkled animals, he sent the guys on three days' journey. He wanted a distance to be so far, so there would be no excuse for him to change his mind. And then something happened. When, when Jacob took his own sparkled animals, his own, the, the animals that had the spot, all, for, for some supernatural reason, the ones that were sparkled began to reproduce much more than Laban's farm. In fact, Laban's business went down, Jacob's own went up. Can you shout amen? The imperfect animals, the animals that had command on them were the ones who were very fruitful. Why? 
because he sowed in the spirit. Glory to God. Look at it. Verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord spoke to him in a dream, saying, Jacob, here I am, here I am. He said, here I am. He said, and he said, lift your eyes now and see. All the ram. See, the angel told him how to do his business. See, God can tell you how to run your business. Shout amen. And he said, lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks were uh, speck, speckled and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. So God said, I've seen everything, all the deceit. And Laban have you know what? I will reward you now. I'll show you something supernatural. So then give me verse um, 42. 42. Genesis 31, 42. He says, Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, have been with me. Surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. You see that? Because of the issues that are going to uh, going on to two of them. Say, God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. He, he is talking now to Laban of all the deception he did to him. Glory to God. So Jacob eventually developed his own flock much bigger than Laban's own. Why? He now saw the blessing of God working in his life. When you sow to the spirit, you reap corruption. Sorry, when you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. When you sow to the spirit, you reap, absolutely, you reap an everlasting life. Are you seeing that? That will tell your neighbor later to follow the instruction of God's spirit. That's how to sow in the spirit. How you sow in the spirit is you walk in the spirit. When the spirit of God tells you what to do, you do exactly what he told you. That's how to sow in the spirit. When you sow in the spirit that way, you get spirit result. But you sow into the flesh with your own smartness, with your own IQ, you want to do it your own way and not follow God's way, it will crash. Because the God who is talking to you has already seen the end from before you even start it in the first place. Child, amen. Number three. How does God transform us? By making all things work together for our good. Look at that. You know what happened to Jacob? After Jacob married Leah, Leah was actually um, not accepted to Jacob. Jacob didn't actually love Leah that way. So he actually rejected her you know, in, in, the, in the home. And um, God did something to, to Leah's life. God did something supernatural to Leah. You know what happened to Leah? Look at Genesis um, 29. 31 and 32. Something happened to Leah's life. God blessed her so much. The Bible says that um, for Rachel, the Bible says that in fact, when, when, uh, when Jacob was serving to get Rachel, the Bible says that the seven years felt like days to him. That's how much he loved her. And then when Laban deceived him and gave her Leah, he actually didn't love her, he didn't care about her, he didn't give her attention. And then Leah saw that this man wasn't really taking care of her. But guess what? Even in that situation she was going through, God smiled on her. Bible says, when the Lord saw, so who saw it? When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, what, what did God do? He opened that womb and Rachel was barren. Two of them were actually barren at the beginning, but then Rachel and Leah's womb was opened. Then look at what happened next. So Leah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Reuben. He says, why? He says, For the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. That's the meaning of the word Reuben, by the way. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. She thought her husband would love her because of the children. You know? <laughs> and then, <laughs> look at what happened next. Verse 2. I'm sorry. Um, Genesis 31. Oh, actually, hold on for a moment. So, Leah was an accidental wife. Everybody say accidental wife. Wife we didn't plan for. He now got married to her. But when this happened... Something God did in her life. God began to build the house of Israel through Leah. Now look at this very carefully. Leah had about eight, um, I think more than six children. But look at this very carefully. Leah was the one who gave birth to um, Levi. Right? That is where the priesthood was born. See the first blessing? Then Leah also was the one that gave birth to Judah. Judah is where we have all the kings produced. All the kings in the Bible were from the house of Judah. All the priests were from the house of Levi. So guess what? From Leah, God blessed her with priesthood and kingship. Are you seeing that? That's what God, that's the supernatural thing that God did for, um, for Leah. So it looks like her life was going to become a mess. 
It looked like our life was going to be a waste. But you know what God did? God turned everything together for our good. Sometimes in your life, you may have made some terrible mistakes. And it looks like as though your life is going to be cut short. You are wasting your life. Listen, if you, if you are able to trust the grace of God, God can turn that mess into a mighty message. He can turn that mess into a great story. Can you shout amen? If you only trust God, if you only trust in his grace, he can turn your messy situation, your terrible stories into a great one. That's what God can do. And that will get, that's what God did for Leah. She gave birth to six sons and two were from her, from her handmaiden. That's what she did. And Leah, who, who lived on, guess what? Something happened again to, to Jacob's life. Leah was the one who lived on with Jacob, even after Rachel died. She was the one who lived on to the later days. And she was the one who helped and supported him in the later days in his marriage. Glory to God. And listen, you know, I told you when Jacob stayed with um, Laban after six more years, he told him that it's time for me to go. Because now, um, Jacob was learning that he was not in control and he could not work things out to the flesh. All the games, the schemes of manipulation, the schemes of scamming, the schemes of cunning did not produce any results in his life. Jacob said, you know what? It's time for me to go. Things were so unpleasant between Laban and Jacob. Look at Genesis 31 verse 2. The Bible says, and Jacob saw that the countenance of Laban and indeed it was not favorable towards him as before. So he knew that. So God had to use this situation to prompt Jacob that you are in your comfort zone for too long. It's time to go back to the land that I promised you. Because the land where he was, was not the land that God told him to stay. He was just trying to walk things out by his flesh. It was all a waste of time. Sometimes some of you, God has told you what exactly to do. You are saying, mm -mm. It, it, you know, for instance, I, I, was telling, uh, I was talking to a pastor, which, which day was that, a few days ago. And... Uh, he was telling me how that he was in Lagos. And when he was in Lagos, he had a good job. And then he was just not at peace. He was just not at peace at all. And God said, you go back to Yola. He thought, for what reason is he going back there for? But he followed the spirit. He sowed into the spirit and he reaped the spirit reward. He reaped the spirit fruit. Praise God. When you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. You know, you can have all the money and still be unhappy. You, maybe you have no experience here, right? You can have all the money you want and still be unfulfilled in life. It can happen. But if you are in God's place, in God's time, for God's purpose, in God's way, everything will turn out well. Can you shout amen? It is better to be in God's will than not to be in God's will and be saying you're enjoying your life. It will all turn to corruption. It will all turn to corruption. Glory to God. So God used the friction between Laban and Jacob to tell Jacob that it's time to return to the promised land. Now, it's easy to look at 20 years from a human perspective, from a human viewpoint, and regard it as wasted years. But in the midst of what was going on, the jealousy, the bargaining, the, 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 the scamming, all the cunningness that was going on, God was working out his purpose in the life of Jacob. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The Bible says that all things can work together, want to go everybody. It says, and we know that all things work together for, do, for those. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Let me read again with power. Want to go read. Yes. Yes. How much time do I have left? I'm not seeing you on the screen. He says, and we know. That all things work together for good to those who are loved, who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Say all things that work together for my good. Say it again. Say all things are working together for my good. Thank you. If you believe it, say it again. Say all things are working together for my good. Do you believe it? Shout amen. That's what God does. All God can make all things work together for your good. Doesn't matter how terrible your life has been. Doesn't matter the mistakes you have done. If you will trust him, if you will believe him, if you will anchor your faith on the grace of God, he can change that story and give you a mighty testimony. Hallelujah. Now look at the fourth thing that God does. God brings us to the end of ourselves. That's how God transforms us. The problem 
um, that, you know, after, after God told Jacob to go back to the promised land, Jacob had a major problem. And the problem was Esau. Because the, in, before he departed, Esau told him that the next time I see you, you'll be a dead man. That's what Esau told him. So now, Jacob has not still learned to walk in the spirit. He still wanted to use his human efforts to get to you know, to see how to can, he can change the situation and circumstance. You know what Jacob did? Jacob used his smartness again. As he was going back to, to the promised land, and he was about to go in the face of, 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 of Esau, he even learned, he sent people ahead to find out what was going on in Esau's life. He found out that Esau had over 400 men as army. <laughs> Esau is ready. He said, oh boy, 400 guys are coming after me. What am I going to do next? So you know what he did? He now began to send gifts to appease Esau. He sent gifts ahead of Esau, human effort. He was sending gifts ahead of him, you know, to try to appease Esau. And then he was still trying to, he was still scheming. He was still using, he was still walking in the flesh. He was still scheming his way to get the situation to change in his favor. So he planned how he was going to attempt to appease Esau with a gift. Look at Genesis 32. I'll read from verse 12. Genesis 32, sorry, from verse 13. Genesis 32 from verse 13 to 20. It says, so he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present to Esau, his brother. 200, look at, look at the gift he sent to his brother. Let's do the mathematics now. 200 female goats and 12, 20 male goats. <laughs> 200 ewes and 20 rams. This was the gift he sent. What a gift. 30 milk camels with their court. 40 cows and 10 bulls. 20 female donkeys and 10 fowls. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servant every, um, every drove by itself and said to his servant, pass before me and put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong? And where are you going? Who are these in front of you? Then you shall tell him, they are your servants, <laughs> Jacob. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, who followed the drove, saying, In this, you shall speak to Esau when you find him. Verse, next, next verse. And also, and, and also said, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with a present that goes before him. And afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept. So you look at Jacob. He was still scheming his way. He still leaned on his own understanding. What does the Bible say about that? You lean on your understanding, you're going to get perversion. Glory to God. Now something happened to Jacob. When Jacob was on this journey, um, chapter 22, verse 24, the Bible says, when Jacob was left alone, something happened. A man wrestled with him. Next verse, 24. Until the breaking of day. Look at that. He took his brother by the... So, you know what happened to... to um, some people say, oh, he wrestled with a man. Um, it's not a man he actually wrestled with. Actually, Jacob did not wrestle with anybody. It was God who was wrestling with Jacob. That's what the Bible says. You want to see it? <laughs> because then we say, oh, you are wrestling with God. Mm -mm. God was wrestling in the same way God wrestles with us today. God is the one wrestling with us. When will you come to the end of yourself? When will you stop leaning on your understanding and allow me to lead you in your life? That was the wrestling that God was having with Jacob. But that Jacob was still struggling. He is still, still adamant. He still wants to do things by his own efforts. You know what happened to him? You know what God did? God struck him by his thigh bone. From that day, when Jacob wants to walk, he has to limp. He has to limp like this. To remind him that learn to trust in him. Hallelujah. Look at, look at, look, look at um, Hosea chapter 12. Look at what the Bible says. It says, he took his brother by the, by the heel in the womb. And in his strength, he struggled with God. You see that? He's always struggling with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept 
and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. Now look at Genesis 22 and 32, verse 30. Genesis 32, verse 30. Everybody on the screen wanted to go. Called the name of the place, what? Penel. Why? Say, for I have seen God. So it was God who was wrestling with Jacob. Not an angel, not a man. You see that? Usually in the, in the Old Testament, you always see this phrase, an angel of the Lord. Sometimes you see the angel of his presence. It doesn't mean actually an angel. Sometimes actually the Holy Spirit himself, that means God himself, appearing in the form of a man. Like the way, like the way God appeared to Joshua. And Joshua said, who are you? He said, I am the captain of the host of the Lord, saying that I am God. So sometimes God appears in human form. You have been doing that in the Old Testament. And the same way Jesus became flesh in human form. Glory to God. Are you still with me? All right, good. So, so Jacob called the place, he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Look at that. And then he erected an altar there and called it um, Elion Israel. See that? And this was the day that God changed his name. See, remember, Israel, even though it's a name of a nation, was actually the name of a person. And this person was Jacob. This is when God transformed his life. God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And he says, no longer will you be a deceiver. You will now become a prince, a man that has power with God, a man that is a prince with God. Glory to God. That's what happened. So God touched the socket of his ear and he became dislocated. From this moment, he walked, when he's walking in his life, he will always limp. So his lameness, the reason why God did that to him was so that his lameness will remind him not to scheme in life anymore. Not to manipulate, but to trust God. That's what God was doing in his life. Praise God. So through faith in God, he will prevail. And his name was changed to Israel, a prince with God. Look at Genesis 32 verse 30. So Jacob, okay, that's, that's fine. Genesis 32 verse 30. All right, hold on, I'll read this one. Look at, look at, um, give me verse 31, then we'll go to verse 32. Uh-huh. He says, just as he crossed over Penel, I want you to mark this word, the sun rose on him. I'll come back to that in a moment. The sun rose on him. Why did God tell us that? There's a reason for that. I'll come to that. He says, and he limped on his hip. Every time he limped. And he came across a certain place and stayed there. No, um, 32 now. 32. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank. You see that? which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Are you falling? Are you still here? Now, listen very carefully. So Jacob's muscle shrank. You see that? Not removed. Listen, God will never remove your flesh. Your flesh needs to shrink. You see that? It has to shrink, because the flesh will never be removed. The flesh will always want, to, want you to skin your way in life. Want you to manipulate your way in life. And the flesh will all want to take control. For Jacob, at this point in his life, his flesh has shrunk. It shrunk. And when he shrunk, the spirit was now supreme in his life. And the spirit now began to reign in Jacob's life. Now, he came to the end of himself. And now his confidence was now in God. Not in the ability to manipulate. But in his ability to trust God in every step in every season of his life. Now, this was when Jacob became a prince with God. At this point in his life, go back to um, 31 now. Genesis 31, I'm sorry, Genesis 32 verse 31. Bible says, and the sun rose on him. Why, why did the Bible tell us this? Because something happened to Jacob in Genesis 28 verse 11. Look at it. He came to a certain place and stayed there all night. Because Genesis 28 verse 11, quickly put it on the screen. He came to a certain place and stayed there all night. Because what happened? Talk to me on the screen. The sun had what? Had set. When the sun set on, ja on Jacob's life, that means the spirit was no longer in function in his life. From that day henceforth, he was living his life based on scheming, based on manipulating, based on the flesh. But the moment he had to put his confidence in the Lord, the Bible says in Genesis 32 verse 20, and the sun rose on Jacob's life. That's when the grace of God began to walk in his life because he put no confidence in the flesh. Hallelujah. You see, when you talk about flesh, people just think it's sin. Mm -mm. Flesh is more than sin. You are, you are thinking um, something wrong. Mm -mm. Flesh is when you are doing things that God never asked you to do. 
when you are doing things based on your human effort, based on your human strength, without consulting the spirit, that's fleshly life. That's the fleshly life. So you can give in the flesh, you can also give in the spirit. Are you seeing that? You can worship in the flesh, you can also worship in the spirit. You can live your Christian life in the flesh or live it in the spirit. Bible said if you sow to the spirit, you reap corruption. You sow, sorry, you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. See that? But if you sow to the spirit, you reap an everlasting life. So how does God make us princes with God? He makes us by transforming us from glory to glory. Are you seeing that? That means, you know what God is doing? God is trying to remodel us, not to put confidence in the flesh. Glory to God. We stop trusting in earthly things. We stop trusting in money. We stop trusting in the things that we can see with our two eyes. We start to trust God 100%. That is the work that we go through day by day. Day by day in our lives. Day by day in our lives. And as we grow in this gradual transformation, we become princes with God. Hallelujah. That's what happened in the life of, 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 of Jacob. And Jacob came to the end of himself. He came to the end of his ability. All, this, all the manipulation came to an end. And then he began to have confidence in God. And from that day in Jacob's life, there was no record of Jacob ever scheming anybody, ever manipulating anybody, ever using his fleshly effort to get things done. Mm -mm, that was the end. Because God said, because from the beginning, God was always wrestling with Jacob. Jacob, when are you going to give in to me? When are you going to let go? He says, then he said, God, today, I will not let go until you bless me. God says, now you're ready. And God says, you know what? I'll give you one sign. God now hit his thigh. He said, from today is forth, you remember this day. And Jacob said, yes, sir. And his life changed forevermore. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm so excited about the gospel. This is how God transforms our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Open your mouth and pray. Speak in tongues everywhere. I'm sure you were so, so, so mightily transformed by the message of grace you received today. Like I said earlier before, I want you to share this video, like this video. I mean, sh share it with your friends. Let them hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that he paid with his own blood. Listen, after God justifies us by faith, he makes us to be sons. And after that, not only does he make us on our livers dear, he also brings us, he also begins to transform our life so that we live our life based on the functionality of what the Holy Spirit has given to us. And he is called the spirit of God's grace. God bless you till we meet again.